What's up? Oh, hi, Matt. Oh, uh, hi. Have you ever seen The Room? Uh, fuck no. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. So, how have you been? Tired. How are you? Tired, but yeah. enjoying life. Yeah, that's good. I recently watched a movie called 1408. Yeah, so did I. Oh, okay. I see, oh, yeah, I see you have it right here. Yeah, it's a complete coincidence, actually, that everything's eventual book, which contains it as a short story, is just sitting right there. Yeah, that was a pretty good short story. Yeah, I also put the Blu-ray there out of complete coincidence as well. Complete coincidence, cool. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, maybe, yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. 1408 is directed by Michael Hofstrom, based off of the Stephen King short story of the same title and stars John Cusack and Samuel L. Jackson. John Cusack plays Mike Enslin, a paranormal debunker of sorts. He goes to hotel rooms or places that are supposedly haunted and writes novels about them. Hmm. You can tell that he, at maybe one point in time, had a little faith maybe in this, but has since lost that faith and no longer believes and kind of spends his time proving to people that these things don't really exist. Samuel Jackson and John Cusack in a movie together, that was good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they just flat out bring it. If Cusack and Sam Jackson mail it in, this movie sucks. Mm -hmm. But they provide authenticity for the audience. Uh, was a short story from Stephen King. Did you read that story? Yes, I did. How'd I think you like it's that? great. Um, the short story starts with Mike Enslin arriving at the Dolphin Hotel. Like, that's the opening. There is no past. There's no surfing scene. There's nothing. It's just, he's at the hotel. He's there to stay at the famed 1408 room for a night. And half of the short story is actually the meeting scene between Samuel L. Jackson and John Cusack. I felt like when I read it, it was almost like the whole damn thing. And then they finally got to yeah. the room stuff, which was really cool. Like, the short stories are great. It does some things better than the sh film. I feel like the film obviously does things better than the short story, like fleshing out the whole experience. Mm -hmm. uh, something that was really great for the short story was the um, madness. He didn't even fucking enter the room yet because the door is all like going. Yeah, I on. fucking love oh, that. Oh, man. And I really, really love the uh, playing up of the cardiac arrest thing um, in the short story. I like um, just the length of it. It was, it was a little bit more stretched out compared mm -hmm. to the film. And uh, I really like just the whole building up of the mystique of this room compared to the film. So Stephen King did a great job. He did. Yeah, he actually listed this as one of his favorite adaptations. He loved this uh, movie. And he understands that when you have a short story and it's supposed to be like this one singular creepy moment, uh, that you're going to have to put some more meat on the bones of that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into some spoilers here if you've never seen 1408. Uh, the movie largely deals with grief and what someone goes through when you lose someone. He lost his daughter in the past, a very young age, to illness. And so it sort of falls in line with the fact that he is just trudging through this job he has as a writer. There's a fan who comes to one of his book signings with his older book that he wrote that was a very personal story that meant something to him. He has since gone away from that and now just writes about how much ghosts probably don't exist and it's this really great way of building his character you see that he is like this weird guy who is catering to a crowd of people who want to know about the paranormal with his new novels that he's writing but at the book signing he's like basically telling everyone that it's bullshit and there's like four people there who want to meet him and that's it yeah i thought that was kind of funny it's a great way to build his character you talked about uh, how he's weird. Um, we were texting each other while watching the movie. We're like, John Cusack is great. So uh, you want to talk about how funny he was. Um, my favorite two lines are um, the one book clerk. He's like whispering when he's signing. He's like, hey, if I want to see a guaranteed ghost, where would I go? He goes, guaranteed? Orlando, Haunted Mansion. And it took me a full second to be like, wait a minute, what did he just say? Did he really just say that? Yeah. Holy shit, that's funny. Yeah. And the second one is. Care for a cigar? No, thank you. I don't smoke. Oh, this, yeah, that's, uh, in case nuclear war breaks out. I, I gave it up a long time ago. It's part habit, part superstition. It's an old writer thing. You do drink, don't you? Of course, I just said I was a writer. But he is really funny in this movie, and one of my favorite moments in the movie, it's this little moment uh, in the elevator between Olin and Enslin. A few years ago, a young maid from El Salvador found herself locked in the bathroom. She was only there for a few moments, but when we pulled her out, she was... She's dead. No, blind. 
She's taking a pair of scissors and gouged her eyes out. She was laughing at Stark. Your floor. Cusack basically has to sell the entire film alone. He's in this room, and it's just the magnetism of his performance. And I think he did a great job. The great thing about this movie is it's literally him. It's this room for like 90% of the film, and it's, it's, it's so riveting. Uh, going back all the way back to your first uh, bit of that monologue was um, we watched the commentary, and that first scene with him with the bed and breakfast, uh, the earlier draft before these two guys came on to rewrite it, um, there was actually going to be a false scare, like, um, I forget what it was, it was like some kind of like dead baby, but like, I think the people running the bed and breakfast were faking it. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm glad I didn't do that, because it shows that this guy has been put up with a bunch of shit that's been faked, or he hasn't seen anything because he's not a believer, yeah. and he writes about it. In the commentary, the writers were talking about how they appreciated the first draft, but they didn't want that false scare there because that sort of puts the audience in this position where what they're seeing isn't real. Yeah. And so they never lie to us. Like, when shit gets real in 1408 The Room, it's all really happening. Yeah, that's great. Uh, this film, it, it's, it's a great back-and-forth uh, drama. Uh, you have these things going on to him, and then there's a, you know, a lot of say spoilers. There's yeah. a false ending, and um, I, that's my favorite false ending, probably. Maybe besides, like, Alien or something. When, you know, the... And this is for the director's cut, uh, which is, side note, really weird... This Blu-ray is director's cut only. So if you bought this Blu-ray, there's no, there's three different endings which we can talk about. But this is the director's cut. It's got all the extended footage for the most part. And you're going to see the director's cut ending, even though apparently the director doesn't like the ending. It's strange how that's just like the most readily available cut. There is no theatrical Blu-ray. It's weird because I think the DVD had theatrical cut and yeah. then maybe the alternate endings. <laughs> But yeah, this film, if you're expecting like to see a bunch of apparitions and shit, you're not going to get that satisfaction. Here's really smart. It's kind of like the Babadook. You might see some stuff, but it's actually like, like there's some really deep shit here. Yeah. And if you go into expecting like to see like a Conjuring, you're not going to be satisfied. But if you want to see like a Babadook or a smart type of thriller, this is your movie right here. If you go into 1408, the film, thinking that it's about a haunted hotel room. Yes. You're going to be disappointed because it's about a haunted man. Yes. You know, that, that's really what it's about. This past life that he has been dealing with where his daughter uh, died at such a young age, him and his wife going through problems, his dad apparently hates him and doesn't think that he's a good writer, his dad's in a nursing home, and when you go into this room, it just takes all of your most horrific things that could ever happen to you and puts that in front of you and makes you relive it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like ghosts are popping out at him. That happens a few times. Yeah. You get your, your normal horror movie stuff. Yeah. Um, there's an amazing doppelganger scene where he oh, walks yeah. uh, and he sees like a reflection of himself and he does all these things. It was like a tribute to the Marx Brothers, this uh, old Marx Brothers routine. That's one of my favorite scares in the movie too when he turns around and that crazy guy is there or woman, I don't know, like with a it's, knife or something. Yeah, it's funny because in the or commentary uh, everyone thinks it's a girl. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was too but apparently it's like this uh, former like mixed martial artist who's like fucking badass. I yeah. think he's actually Cusack's like personal trainer mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it's, it's a dude. <laughs> I thought it was a chick too yeah. but it, it was like the, the claw hammer mechanic man Maniac or something, yeah. I think it's the official title. But uh, I think my favorite like scare sequence is, um, I always look forward to it when I watch this movie, is him going out the window and like hugging the wall and then seeing that, because he wants to get into the other room. Uh, but there's no window there. It's just like, oh, that's some great shit. Yeah, and in a strange way, that's almost like a little homage to a Stephen King story called The Ledge that's in an anthology movie called Cat's Eye that had Drew Barrymore in the 80s, hmm. where this guy is forced on a bet to traverse a ledge all the way around a building. And despite the extra things like the surfing, the daughter backstory, and all of that kind of stuff that's included in this movie, it's actually very faithful to the short story. There's a lot of things that are direct quotes. The phone, 
saying things like, this is five, this is eight. In the book, it's this is six, this is six. Uh, when he is fanning through Olin's folder and you see that text, my brother was eaten by wolves on the Connecticut turnpike. Mm -hmm. It's such a weird, fucking creepy-ass sentence. And I it's know. In the short story, it's um, the last intelligible thing that Mike said into his recorder yeah, in so the short weird. story. Having that just in the notepad and having it be something that's a quick insert shot that you read, it kind of recreated the creepy sense of reading it in the book, too. Because it's such a weird-ass sentence, and it works a lot in the movie. Something that's actually not technically in the book is in this movie as well. Because if you read in this, King has an introduction to the 1408 short story. And he talks about what inspired him to write it. And in his introduction, he's like, hotel rooms are a naturally creepy yeah. place, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, how many people have slept in that bed before? How many of them were sick? Yeah. Hotel rooms are a naturally creepy place. Don't you think? I mean, how many people have slept in that bed before you? How many of them were sick? How many of them lost their minds? Before I came here also, I saw one of his films. It's really good. It's called Evil. I think it's like Angstrom something Swedish. Okay. Um, really liked it. I really like this movie, but I think Evil's better. Really? Like, I've never seen it. I think his style is like, because I just saw Baby Driver. Maybe it's like kind of Spielberg and Edgar Wright had a baby. It's But it's kind of simple. Um, but it's very, you know, camera moving and all that stuff. So I, overall, I enjoyed the direction here. A couple nitpicks, but um, what do you think? I think it's really strong. Um, my only issue, real issue, with this movie is the edit. Um, I can understand that they have a hard time with the fact that it's really just one guy in a room. They don't yeah. have a lot of people to cut to. They don't have a lot of actors to cut to. It's just Cusack and a room. Um, there's a lot of cool things to do with the room, but sometimes it can be a little rapid fire, the editing, and sometimes early on, the, the editing of the dialogue can be slightly unnatural. There's one specific scene at the book signing where the back and forth between himself and his fans just doesn't flow properly. Any question? Where's the scariest place you've ever been? Scariest place I've ever been? Uh, I've never heard that question before. That's a joke. Well, all these places have very colorful histories. Um, I would say if I had to pick a top one, I would say Bar Harbor, the site of the Grizzly McTeague wedding night murders. That's an intense place. Or maybe St. Cloud, Minnesota, where the crazed war widow threw her baby down a well. I mean, those all have a lot of, I mean, it's thick. The air is thick. What about poltergeists? Look, I'm a good researcher. And it's because it's edited so rapidly. It's almost like they just really wanted to get to the room as quick as possible. And then there are moments in the room where you can feel like it's a series of creepy events that just keep unfolding without a whole lot of narrative structure. Like one crazy thing will happen and then you're just thrown right into the next one. Like when the TV comes on and for the first time you see a home movie of his daughter. Yeah. As soon as it shuts off, he basically turns like this and sees the creepy ghosts walking out the window. Which, by the way, I love what they did with these ghosts. They didn't just make them like weird apparitions. They made them really sad and haunted, and um, they made them look black and white, almost like old film. Yeah. Which was really different, and I had yeah. never seen that before. But that's really my only major issue with the movie, is the edit can be a little rapid. Yeah. I've noticed that semi static thing in the beginning. I think it was for the Ben and Breakfast stuff. And I think it's just the edits were a little jarring, but the rest of it I thought was okay. The only things I had a couple nitpicks were like um, there's a flashback with the uh, arguing with the wife, and he's like screaming and yelling, he's being very angry. And then the next sentence was literally, "I'm gonna go get a cigarette." It was like really cheery, and, yeah. like, and it was fast. I was like, "Whoa, wait a minute! You were just like literally screaming, and then now you're, I'm gonna go get a cigarette." Like, and that's what, what I'm talking about—that unnatural dialogue flow yeah. that sometimes occurs in the edit. You know what I think. We should have done more! We did everything no, we could. No, we didn't. We should have helped her fight. Oh, my God. Instead of filling her head full of these stories about heavens and the clouds and nirvana and all that. Those stories, she liked them. I'm going to get some cigarettes, okay? The sequence towards the end when he thinks he's out, I think maybe goes on for five more minutes than it should before 
the great bit where the, the post office workers from 1408 are ripping the wall away and you realize, oh my God, I'm still in this fucking room. I love that bit. It's yeah. so great. I think I like everything in this except the ending. I like the ending. Which one? <laughs> um, we can talk about that right now. I'm glad yeah. you asked. Um, so this is the director's cut. It's the ending with Sam Jackson getting the closure. I think you get three different endings. So Sam Jackson gets the closure in this one. Um, he's the guy with the tape recorder and plays it. Here's the little girl's voice. The other one was the theatrical cut, which we won't, <laughs> the one we're used to. Yeah, um, is probably the best. Cusack. That's the one the director um, likes a lot. Um, so Cusack gets the closure. The wife's in a different room, and he hears the voice, and then it ends. And he, he's of course alive. And he's alive. Um, this, the the other one is alternate number one on this Blu-ray. So alternate number two is the theatrical, and this one's the director's. So alternate number one is uh, with Tony Shalhoub. Yeah, he gets the closure. Um, he doesn't have a tape recorder hear the voice. I really like this ending. It, he gets the manuscript that was written in the false ending. Me too. And the way it's edited together and the office is empty as the director pulls the camera all the way back and the doors close. And it's really creepy. And the line that the dad says, it, it's a call back to before, uh, foreshadowing his death. And um, I, I, that's my favorite ending. I really like that one. Uh, the fact, the idea that the book was written and somehow has been put into the actual world. Yes. I really like that idea. What comes before that, eh. He's yeah, just, yeah. He's I just can, like talking to her in an office I and they sad. I can agree with that. I, I think if they somehow, like, could somehow mash up the three to make, like, the ideal ending, that's also an issue, is that they really couldn't figure out how to end this movie. Yeah. There's a lot of theories about this movie and, and what it really means, the symbolism behind it. Who sent the postcard? That kind of thing. What or who is Olin? You know, is he the devil? Is he like the gatekeeper to hell or whatever? The way that I sort of view his experience in the room is probably likened through uh, Dante's Inferno, which is mentioned in this movie when he's in the cold part, like the freezing cold part. He, he's like, I'm in, I'm in this circle. What circle am I in right now? And he's thinking about Dante's Inferno. Hmm. And there's the parts where it's really burning hot. There's parts where it's really burning cold. Then he goes through grief and all kinds of things. And there's also this theory that's developed about the stages of grief, the five stages of grief uh -huh. where you're in denial and then your eventual acceptance of it, that he goes through all stages of grief as well throughout this his experience in the room. So in a strange way, it's almost like despite how terrible his experience is for him, it's cathartic as well. Yeah. Because he's working through his major life issues in this room. Yeah. So it's kind of beautiful, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think I, for my theory, for who sent the postcard, I think it's Mr. Olin. I don't think Mr. Olin's the devil. You could probably think that because there's alternate footage that when he's, or when the workers are tearing down the post office and he's watching it and like there's Mr. Olin randomly as like an apparition or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can see why people think he's the devil, but I don't think he really, I think he's an actual person. I think it's the final shot of the elevator doors closing on him. When they close on his head, he just has this look like he knows something that he didn't say. I don't think he's the devil necessarily. I, I think he's probably just a really concerned uh, guy. Yeah. But it, it, there's just some. There's a look in his eye that seems to sell that there's more there than you would expect. Okay, so two things I want to remember. So the first thing would be uh, Sam Jackson. Uh, I think they said it in interviews or something. But in the short story, it's a like a maybe British, but he's plumpy, short guy saying, mm -hmm. don't go in that room. You're going to have that guy. Or are you going to have Sam Jackson say, don't go in that fucking room, yes. motherfucker? Yes. Which one are you going to be like, oh, shit, I shouldn't go in that room? It's it's Sam Jackson. Exactly. So Hold on to your butts. <laughs> um, the second thing would be, I think Olin sent the postcard. So maybe he is the devil as like a metaphor for getting uh, Mike in the room. Um, but who else would have sent it? And also, all three endings um, have... Uh, Olin Jackson pretty much like saying there's so the theatrical and the uh, alternate they, uh, he's got a drink in his hand he's in the office well done Mr. Ensign exactly well done. after the room's destroyed so it's more clear in the director's cut where he has the box of shit for the wife he's all like ecstatic he's all like happy he's like the room's finally you don't understand the room's finally closed yeah. down it was almost like it was meant to be he tried to get Mike in he knew Mike was going to be adamant and uh Finally got the room shut down. Yeah, so the director's cut's more clear, the theatrical's a little more washed out, which is what most people saw, obviously, when the theories were developed. 
True. Like, like the people who went to see the movie, they saw the theatrical. Like, who is Olin? You go and see the director's cut. Oh, he's okay. He's the manager. He's not. He's not this or that. The devil. <laughs> so yeah, but it's it's funny to hear people who have seen different cuts because there's like true. there's different cuts out there. Some people just have the DVD. Some people just have the Blu-ray. And that's the fault of the studio for not just releasing a definitive cut. Yeah. Hey, which it's is 4K. Yeah, 4K gives some. Damage. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of Olin, he shows up at one point in the room as a little man in the mini bar, and it might be my favorite moment ever delivered by a Cusack in a movie. He. It's like every bit of this movie has been building to him completely losing his shit. Like, he, he's, he, he gets really nervous a lot and very anxious. And he's constantly on edge once things really start happening. But it's all building to that moment where he just he's loses it. How many spirits have you broken? She's in so much pain. What do you want from me? Huh? What? Do you want from me? You. I want my drink. That is like top five movie freakouts. Like, oh yeah, that, that's like better than anything Nicolas Cage has ever done. It's like, it's just great. so great because the movie, its actually warranted. Yeah, yeah I'm not yeah. laughing at it. Yeah, I, it's warranted. Yeah, it's a great buildup of writing and directing, and like I said, ties back to the beginning when I said if he mails that shit in, this movie is like the bees. Ah, <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. There is a nitpick I commonly hear about this movie from people, and that's that Olin says electronics do not work in this room, yet. He uses his laptop. Mm -hmm. So, like, the best way that I can think to describe that beyond the fact that it could have been an oversight is that either the room wants him to use the laptop to get the wife to come to the room because at one point the laptop, the room, like, takes it over and presents a fake yes. version of, of Mike to get his wife to come there. Yeah. So I, that's kind of the way I think it is. Like, it, it's not that the it's, like, this plot hole. The room, I think, is basically, it allows things to happen. The room is this entity that allows whatever it wants to happen. And if the laptop working at that moment is what it wants, that's going to happen. Yeah, I agree 110% with you. I don't agree with that criticism. The only nitpicks I would have is technical stuff, like you said, and which ending do I want? That's the only yeah, problem same. I have with this film. Definitely. My favorite scene in the movie, and I don't know about you, is probably the scene between Jackson and Cusack. That long scene where they are going over the motions. It's this great power struggle because he comes in there and he's like, look, I'm going to the room. I got the law on my side. You can't tell me I can't stay in this hotel room. It's vacant. Like, you got to give it to me. And then Olin's like, no, I'm going to bribe you with this amazing drink. Mm -hmm. You're going to look at all of these pictures. And, and it's, it's also exceptionally acted um, between the two of them. They're just they're playing back and forth so well. And uh, that's one of the things that works so well about once you get to the room is the setup is so good that when he opens the door and it's just like a normal room and the first actual scare that happens is the toilet paper and the chocolates. Yeah. You're like, oh, shit. Like you're that for some reason was really amazing. Because they set it up so well. They did. It wasn't just like, you know, the window coming down on his hand or the crazy person with the hammer or whatever. Yeah, you see an apparition right away. Yeah. It was like, oh shit, the chocolates are back. And then he go he goes kind of crazy. He's like, did he dose me? Did he did he did he poison this drink? And then he starts like sipping it and he's he's talking to the recorder so much and you really get the sense of who he is with no one else in this room and that's really good writing and acting. Yeah, this film does a couple of great moments. There's uh, one I remember in particular about the direction. Like he's doing something, he's like very paranoid and there's like a double snap zoom of him. Yes. That was great. Another thing is like, there's, there's a, it's fucking awesome. Um, there's a vent and like he has like a, a, a newspaper or something he like kind of hits it <laughs> and he kind of looks up and he looks around his, his eyes dart and he hits it again yeah <laughs> Again, the scariest stuff about it has nothing to do with ghosts or demons or anything or the fact even that the room is evil. It's lines like when he sees his dad in the nursing home and his dad says, 
as you were. I was. As I am. You will be. You're looking at your future. This crippled old man, that's going to be you one day. And it just sends chills down your spine when you think about that. And that's the best type of King storytelling right there. Is when he's able to tap into that primal fear that we have. Most of us aren't afraid of ghosts. A lot of us are afraid of dying. I alone, think all of us alone are. in a nursing home. Yeah, that's you know, hard. like that's the creepy shit that this movie explores. Like the really dark, underlying grief that you can have as a person. And I think it's great. I think it's a great movie. I love it. I think this is great too. It's a very smart psychological thriller. It might be one of my favorites. And I, I will classify this as torture porn. It's very not like over the top saw shit, but like mentally psychological torture porn. I'm gonna give 1408 an A minus. That's a pretty good score. I'm going to give uh, this edition, the director's cut, an 8 because of some of the technical stuff. And I really like the alternate number one ending with Tony Shalhoub in the manuscript. That one gets a 9 from me. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me in this review, Matt. I appreciate it. Please do check out Matt's channel. It is in the description below. And as always, if you like this, you can click right here and get stuck in my eyes. <sighs> oh, my God. Well, uh, I'm going to go get food or something. Oh, yeah. Let's go eat, huh? Come on. Let's go. Are you going to come or no? Just. It's kind, it's kind, <laughs> what a story, Matt. It's kind of late, so I don't know if uh, what will be open. But <laughs> So you want to get food with me? In a minute, bitch. Well, I was thinking about getting McDonald's. I hate the doors a lot. Chris went? We have Chris here. He will be watching Dragon Ball Evolution for the rest of his life. We have a similar fate in store for you. Fuck that. No, I'm not watching the room. No, no. Hi. No, Can I help you? no. Can you have a dozen red roses, please. Oh, hi, Johnny. I didn't know it was you. <laughs> no, no, no. Here you go. Uh -oh. That's me. Uh -oh. Please don't make me watch this shit. Hi, no, why? Thanks a lot. Why? Bye bye. No, no, let me down. No, no, no.